Chuck Wagon MTG is sponsored by BC Comics and Games. Welcome and thank you for joining us for another great video here on Chuck Wagon MTG. Today we're going to be talking about the upcoming Guilds of Ravnica pre-release. Now, before we take a look at the cards, we're going to go over a few of the basics for any of you that may be new to pre-release events. So, when you first sign up for the pre-release event, you're going to choose your guild or your color combination. The guilds are Boros, which is red and white, Selesnya, which is green and white, Izzet, that's blue and red, Golgari, which is black and green, and Demir, that's black and blue. Now, after you've chosen your guild or your colors, uh, you're going to go sit down, and then when the event starts, the people hosting the event are going to hand you a pre-release kit, which is going to have five packs of Guilds of Ravnica in it. It's also going to have a seated pack that's going to contain 15 cards from the guild or the color combination you picked when you first signed up, with one of those cards being a foil rare or a foil mythic, and that's going to be your pre-release promo card. So now you've got all of your packs, you've opened them all up, and all your cards are spread out before you, but where do you start? While your rares and your mythics can be very powerful game changers, and please don't underestimate that, uh, the majority of your battle will be fought with your commons and uncommons, as these are the cards that are going to kind of hold off your opponents until you can play those big rares and mythics. Now, keep in mind, all of the advice that we're giving you here uh, all depends on the cards you actually open, since everything is kind of random. Uh, but typically, creatures tend to win your games. So personally, I run at least 15 of them. Uh, and then the more of those that have some kind of evasion, the better. Evasion is anything that makes it harder to block, like flying, menace, uh, or unblockable. The next important thing to remember is removal. While destroying or exiling a creature is best, enchantments like Luminous Bonds or Capture Sphere can work just as well. Essentially, whatever we can do to remove their creatures from being able to enter combat. Now, the next bit of advice we have is to keep your colors simple. Unless you have some kind of decent amount of mana fixing in your cards, sticking to your two strongest colors is generally a good idea. Now, this particular set does have guild gates and shock lands and guild colored and mana producing artifacts, so as long as you get enough of them, going a third color may be an option, but if you're in doubt, it's usually better to just stick to the two strongest colors you have. The last bit of advice that we have to offer is to read over all of the cards in the set before you attend the pre-release. Now, you don't need to memorize every card in the set, but having an idea about what the cards do that you're going to be encountering and playing with will help you recognize which of your colors are going to be the strongest, and it's also going to help you speed up your deck building process. And now, on to the cards. Here are five best commons and uncommons from each color. Now, we're not going to cover any of the multicolor cards, as they're very dependent on the rest of your card pool, and frankly, we have no idea what you're going to pull. With that being said, let's go ahead and start with the white cards. In no particular order, we have Rock Charger, a 1-3 bird for 2 generic and 1 white mana that has flying, and whenever Rock Charger attacks, target attacking creature without flying gains flying until end of turn. Now, it's a 1-3 flyer for 3 mana, which isn't great, but giving another creature flying is. Giving your 4-5 beater that's on the ground flying for the turn sounds like a really fun time to me. Next up, we have Hunted Witness, a 1-1 human for 1 white mana. When Hunted Witness dies, create a 1-1 white soldier creature token with lifelink. This one is simple. It's a 1-1 for 1 mana, and that's not bad. But it replaces itself with a lifelinking 1-1 version of itself, and that is great in my book. Take this thing all day. 
Next up, we have Flight of the Equinauts, a 4-5 human knight for 7 generic and 1 white mana. It does have Convoke, and it does have Flying. Now, a 4-5 flyer for 8 mana is not good, but the Convoke brings this card into the upper part of being good. It's not one of the best cards in the set, but a 4-5 flyer is going to be hard to deal with, and the fact that you can get this out possibly turn four or five, if you're lucky, makes it somewhat playable. Up next is Luminous Bonds, an aura for two generic and one white mana that enchants a creature. Enchanted creature can't attack and it cannot block. I liked this card in every set that has come out before this one. I liked it in this set. And for limited, I will like it in probably most every set that it comes in after this one. This is the next best thing of removal that white really has to offer, so I am going to take it. And last but certainly not least, we have Conclave Tribunal, an enchantment for three generic and one white mana. It does have Convoke, and when Conclave Tribunal enters the battlefield, exit target non-land permanent and, and opponent controls until Conclave Tribunal leaves the battlefield. Removal is important, and this one can target Planeswalkers or any non-land permanent that's posing a threat to you, so this is another one that I really love. The fact that it has Convoke on it just makes it even better. And now, on to the blue cards. Up next, we have Enhanced Surveillance. It's an enchantment for one generic and one blue mana. You may look at an additional two cards each time you surveil, and you can exile Enhanced Surveillance. You get to shuffle your graveyard into your library. Now, Surveil is a new mechanic with Guilds of Ravnica. This can really help you find the cards you need while filtering out the cards that you don't. Now, I understand that this is only good if you have a decent amount of surveils in your deck, uh, so do keep that in mind, but there does seem to be quite a bit in there, so it shouldn't be too hard to find it. And, as a bonus, if your opponent happens to be killing off your creatures or milling you out throughout the beginning part of the game, the second part of this card can come in really handy. Next up, we have the City Watch Sphinx, a 5-4 Sphinx for 5 generic and 1 blue mana that has flying, and when City Watch Sphinx dies, you get to Surveil 2. This thing, it's big, it flies, and when it dies, we get to Surveil 2. This is what I really want to be doing mid-game. This guy is going to be hard to deal with, and the fact that he helps you search through a couple cards just adds a little bit more icing to that beautiful Sphinxy cake. And next we have Night Vale Sprite, a 1-2 Fairy Rogue for 1 generic and 1 blue mana that has flying, and whenever it attacks, we get to Surveil 1. Now, a flying 1-2 for 2 is good. It's not great, but it's good. Uh, the fact that this one gets to Surveil every time it attacks moves this, in my opinion, up to the great scale. I love this card, and I'll probably be running every single copy that I'm fortunate enough to pull. Then we have Capture Sphere, an aura for three generic and one blue mana that has flash. It enchants a creature, and when Capture Sphere enters the battlefield, tap Enchanted Creature. Enchanted Creature does not untap during its controller's untap step. Um, this is the closest thing blue really has to removal in the common and uncommon slots, so I'm just going to take what I can get. If I happen to be playing blue and this card is in the mix, I'm probably going to be playing it. And last but certainly not least, we have Watcher in the Mist, a 3-4 spirit for 3 generic and 2 blue mana. It does have flying, and when it enters the battlefield, we get to Surveil 2. Uh, this card is not broken by any stretch of the imagination, but it is still a good card. Uh, it's a reasonably priced flyer that lets us surveil when it enters the battlefield, and for a flyer, it's got some respectable stats so uh this is one that i'm definitely gonna be running one if not two of i don't know if i'd run any more than that but uh, it's probably gonna make the list if i'm playing blue now on to the black cards once again in no particular order first up we have hired poisoner a 1-1 human assassin for one black mana that has death touch 
A 1-1 one, one that can trade with a 5-5 five, five, uh, can keep your opponents at bay or make them decide between uh, an extra damage every turn this guy comes in or losing one of their probably much better blockers that they happen to have. Um, I love Death Touch and the fact that it's on such a cheap body. Just, I like the heck out of this card. I'm going to be playing this one. Up next, we have the Lotleth Giant, a 6-5 zombie giant for 6 generic and 1 black mana, and it has undergrowth. When Lotleth Giant enters the battlefield, it deals 1 damage to target opponent for each creature card in your graveyard. I love this card. I'm going to say it again, I love this card. Yes, it's 7 mana. I understand that. I am fine with it. By the time you get to drop this thing, your graveyard probably has a decent amount of creatures in it and possibly enough to end the game on its own by simply dealing the direct damage. The fact that it comes in with a body to me is just absolute bonus. I will say it again, I love this card. Next, we have the Pilfering Imp, a 1-1 Imp for 1 black mana that has flying and the ability of pay 1 generic and 1 black, tap it and sacrifice it, target opponent reveals their hand and we get to choose a non-land card from it, they discard it, but we can only activate it at the time we can cast a sorcery. I do like this guy simply for the fact that in the early game we can put this guy out and he can come across and just keep pinging for 1 damage. And then the moment they get a blocker out that can actually deal with this guy, we can then sacrifice him and use him to pull something out of their hand that's going to be a threat later on in the game. I really like how this card is built. Uh, this is just, this is fun in a bun right here. This is, this is good stuff. Now, the next two card slots are actually four cards, but they all essentially have the same result. We use them to do the same thing, so we're kind of grouping them together. Uh, first off, we have Deadly Visit. It's a sorcery for three generic and two black mana. Destroy target creature, and we get to Surveil two. And then the next one is Price of Fame. It's an instant for three generic and one black mana. Uh, it does cost two generic mana less if it targets a legendary creature and destroys target creature, and then we get to surveil two as well so essentially these are just kill spells removal is king um you know chan the chances of your opponent not drawing anything good out of their pool is going to be slim to none and you're going to want a way to deal with that stuff so this is where this that kind of stuff comes in essentially if you're playing black these are almost auto include so for our next pair of cards, uh, we have Severed Strands. It's a sorcery for one generic and one black mana. As an additional cost to cast this spell, we have to sacrifice a creature. We then gain life equal to the sacrificed creature's toughness, and then we get to destroy a target creature and opponent controls. And then the next one is Necrotic Wound, an instant for one black mana that has undergrowth. Target creature gets minus X, minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard, and then if that creature would die, we exile it instead. Um, now, for Severed Strands, removal is removal, and we're going to take every bit we can get. Um, life gain is, I guess, kind of a bonus, but uh, I would honestly play this card uh, without the life gain aspect to it. So, uh, But now, Necrotic Wound, I really like this one. First off, it's cheap. It's only one black mana, and it's instant, so that's even better. But what I absolutely love about this card is that as the game goes on, this card gets better. The more cards you have in your graveyard, the bigger things that this card, this one drop card, can possibly kill. And the fact that it's negative one, negative one counters, or in this case, negative X, negative X, this actually gets around indestructible. So I love this card. 10-10, pick it every time. And now on to the red cards. First up, we have Cosmetronic Wave, a sorcery for three generic and one red mana. Cosmetronic Wave deals one damage to each creature your opponents control, and then creatures your opponents control can't block this turn. Honestly, I, I don't care about the one damage to creatures. Um, even if that was a race from this card, I would still play this. 
is the second part of this card that really gets our catch purring. Uh, if you're running red, there's a good chance you're running a little bit of aggro and you've already gotten in for some early game damage. This card lets us essentially waltz on over and deal a death blow unchallenged by our opponents because they simply cannot block. 10-10, love this card. This is amazing. This is essentially what red is all about. Next, we have the Hellkite Whelp, a 3-3 dragon for 4 generic and 1 red mana. It has flying, and then whenever it attacks, it deals 1 damage to target creature defending player controls. Uh, now, red is really lacking when it comes to flyers, so I don't feel quite as bad paying 5 mana for a 3-3 flyer. And the fact that it does ping a creature of our opponents when it attacks does make it a little better. Uh, it's not great, but like I said, in red, we don't have a whole lot to choose from for flying, so I kind of like it. Next up, we have Gravitic Punch, a sorcery for 3 generic and 1 red mana. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target player. It also has Jump Start, so we can cast this card from our graveyard by discarding a card in addition to paying its other costs, and then it gets exiled. Um, I love any way we can deal direct damage without having to attack, because uh, unless they happen to have a counter spell in hand, this being pre-release, that's not entirely likely. Uh, it's essentially a way for us to punch through for that last little bit of damage uh, without actually having to attack. So I really dig this card. And then we have Street Riot, an enchantment for four generic and one red mana. As long as your turn, creatures you control get plus one plus oh and have trample. Now, red tends to come out of the gate swinging kind of early, uh, but it can lose its steam once our opponents have blockers out. Uh, this is kind of the downfall of red. This particular card helps us get around that by pumping our team and giving everyone trample so we can come out of the gates quick in our early game, deal a bunch of damage, and then once they do have blockers out uh, with this card, hopefully we'll be able to trickle over the last little bit of damage we need to get the job done. And lastly, we have Barging Sergeant, a 4-2 Minotaur Soldier for 4 generic and 1 red mana that has haste and mentor. So whenever this creature attacks, we need to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target attacking creature with lesser power. Now, the reason I love this guy is the fact that him having 4 power means that he's going to almost always trigger mentor on something you happen to have out. And the fact that it has haste makes it even better because uh, it's going to catch our opponent slightly off guard. Um, and then you combine this with something like Street Riot um, and the game should kind of be a wrap from there. I view this as an exceptionally good card. Now, Red does have one honorable mention. We have Inescapable Blaze, an instant for four generic and two red mana. It can't be countered, and it deals six damage to any target. Um, six mana is kind of hefty for what Red wants to be doing, but the fact that it is instant makes it a little bit better, and six damage to any target, which could be either a big creature or or your opponent just to get over that last bit of damage um, makes this card something that should definitely be paid attention to. Um, I most certainly would not build around it, uh, but if you're already running somewhat heavy red, uh, this is kind of a good card to have. And now on to our green cards. First up, we have the Arboretum Elemental, a 7-5 Elemental for 7 generic and 2 green mana. It does have Convoke, and it has Hexproof. Now, a 7-5 is kind of hard to deal with, but it's not impossible. A 7-5 Hexproof is so much more worse. Uh, and the fact that it has Convoke, which means we can start pumping this cuddly fella out onto the field much sooner than our opponents would like, just makes this card that much better. And heaven forbid you get an enchantment to pump this guy up, he is going to be a real nightmare for your opponent. Then we have the Dev Karen Dissident, a 2-2 elf warrior for one generic and one green mana. 
that has the ability of four generic and a green, and we get to give this thing plus two, plus two, until end of turn. Now, a 2-2 two, two for two is perfectly acceptable. It's a bear. They've been around since pretty much the beginning of Magic, and they've always been playable. The fact that we can pump her later on makes this card a lot better. And the fact that we can pump it multiple times, if we happen to have that much mana, makes this card a pretty good card to kind of round your curve out. Next up, we have the Golgari Raiders, a 0-0 Elf Warrior for 3 generic and 1 green mana. It has haste and undergrowth. It enters the battlefield with a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it for each creature card in your graveyard. Now, this is a card that you're going to want to see later on in the game, uh, but even if you only have 4 creatures in your graveyard when you cast this, essentially you're getting a 4-4 with haste for 4 mana, which is a good deal. Now, just imagine if it's even later on in the game and you have 6, 8, or Lord love it, 10 creatures in your graveyard. You now have a 10-10 haste for 4 mana. I will take that all day long. Now, these next two essentially serve the same purpose, so we're going to be putting them together. Uh, first off, we have Pax Favor. It's an instant for two generic and one green mana, and it does have Convoke. Target creature gets plus three, plus three until end of turn. And then we have Might of the Masses, an instant for one green mana. Target creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each creature you control. Um... Now, combat tricks are always fun, and Might of the Masses tends to get better as the game goes along, uh, so we're including both of these kind of together, because like I said, they do the same thing, but they're both pretty good, uh, and can either trade up for a bigger creature, or get through for that last little bit of damage when they decide to not block. Next up, we have Prey Upon, a sorcery for one green mana. Target creature you control fights target creature you don't control. So once again, removal is removal, and we're going to need every bit we can get. So I'm probably going to play every copy of this I get if I'm playing green. Now, we do have an honorable mention for green. It's Urban Utopia, an aura for one generic and one green mana that enchants a land, and when it enters the battlefield, we need to draw a card, and then that land can be tapped for one mana of any color. Now, um, if you happen to be going three colors and one of them is green, this turns out to be an amazing card. To make a land to be able to tap to produce any color mana is really good. Um, the fact that it's only two mana makes it even better, but the fact that it replaces itself in our hands uh, once this enters the battlefield uh, makes this almost an auto-include in any green deck that's going to be running two or more other colors. Well, that about wraps up our Guilds of Ravnica pre-release primer. We hope that some of the information and opinions that we provided help out in the coming event. And then don't forget to enter our contest to get a free entry into the pre-release event of your choice at BC Comics and Games. Uh, we'll go ahead and put up a link in the corner of this video right now so you can check out that video and find out how to enter. Now, if you happen to play in any pre-release events and you did really well or you got some good pulls or maybe you just had a really cool combat trick you'd like to share, we'd love to hear about it down in the comments below. And then if you happen to play at BC Comics and Games, we'd really love to hear about that too. Maybe you saw me there or maybe you were able to collect the bounty they've placed on my head of getting an extra pack of cards just for beating me in the main event this coming Saturday. We'd love to hear about that as well. One last thing we would really like to hear about is your opinion on our first pre-release primer video. We would love to keep doing these in the future, so all the feedback we can possibly get would be greatly appreciated. I'd love to thank everyone for watching, and if you really liked what you saw here today, do us a favor, click that like button, hit subscribe, be sure to hit that little bell notification button so you can tell when we come out with new episodes, and then share this with your friends, your family, your loved ones, and your pets, everyone could use a little more magic in their lives. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and as always, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch, Chuckwagon MTG. Now, if you could do us one last favor and check out this brief message about our sponsor. 
Chuck Wagon MTG is sponsored by BC Comics and Games, now at one mega location to fill all of your gaming and comic needs. They have Magic the Gathering events every night of the week, as well as Warhammer, Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons Adventures League, Final Fantasy TCG, Pokemon, and Star Wars X-Wing events all throughout the week. They also have close to 100,000 comics on site. This is why I have personally made BC Comics and Games my home gaming store.